air lay and basic ferro rod technique class. So maybe maybe kind of basic for some of you guys, but it's kind of nice to, to revisit some of the basics. So today, basically, you guys, uh, my name's Larry Roberts, and I'm from Minnesota. So this southern Missouri deal is completely foreign to me. I don't have my common birch bark, I don't have my aspen to work with, I don't have a lot of things that I'm used to having. But you guys do have cedar here, and you've got a particular type of cedar that seems to be shedding its bark quite readily. So today, um, it rained from about 7 o'clock till, I don't even know how long, but it rained basically all day. And so in an environment where everything is wet, it's nice to kind of test yourself and see what kind of material you can come up with and make a natural ferro rod fire. Obviously, you should carry a, a type of surefire, something like that, with you at all times. But this is practice. We like to practice with this stuff. So, all right, let me just get right into it. What I did is I went to your guys' cedar trees that you have here, and it all seems to be just, like I said, shedding off the tree. And even as much as it rained today, which, I mean, it wasn't a downpour, but it was a steady rain. If you looked at the side of the tree that, that wasn't getting the wind blown at it, on the other side of some trees, not all trees, it was dry, right, right there. And even if it wasn't, even if some of the bark next to it was wet, this stuff was just hanging off the tree like this, just blowing in the wind. It only takes an hour or two to get this back dry again. And also, if I fluff this up, I put it in my cargo pocket, and my body heat helps to dry it. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna process some of this cedar bark down and make a tinder bundle or a fire lay. And after I'm done with the fire lay, I'm gonna explain the two types of ferro rod techniques that I use. So, this is the nice, super fine fibers of the, of the cedar bark. And I'm going to keep it kind of fluffed up like this. Most times when you see a bird's nest, it's literally people are packing it in and making a nice inner bird's nest. That's good for, in my opinion, that's good for an ember, for char cloth, for flint and steel, bow drill, whatever. For a ferro rod, I want that stuff as fluffy and as absolute as I can get it because there's going to be these little individual fibers here that are going to catch fire for you. It's not a solid ember that bursts into flame. You're catching a little spark and one of these little tendrils is going to catch on fire and catch your, your tinder bundle on fire. So I've got this kind of teased up a little bit here. This is going to be what I try to catch on fire. And in a perfect world I'd have something insulating my, my bird's nest from this wet ground. But anyway, that's what I'm going to use. And then I've got a little bit more stuff. I should have more stuff here. But this will still work. I guess my cargo pockets weren't quite as full as I thought they were. But anyway, I'm going to transfer this fire into the fire pit. I could have all this stuff together, but you know, we're in a, in a public, whatever, private campground. And when you're using this, these fire pits, you have to kind of alter your technique. So even, even though it, it rained basically all day today, I was still able to walk around. Really me and my wife took a little nature walk today. And I was able to just walk around and find random twigs. I have no idea what kind of twig this is. But when it pops, that's not the greatest, but it still broke. Standing dead stuff. Really, really fine. It's absolute thinnest diameter as you can possibly get. A lot of the cedars were that were that dry. Just all these smalls with the cedar, it's already got almost like feather sticks off it. I mean, it's got the bark and the, and the little fine tendrils coming off there. That's all going to catch pretty readily. I'm just going to kind of start doing like a, a teepee lay. <clears throat> now, do you have those logs in there for a reason? Yeah, actually I do. This, uh, like I said, it rained a ton, and we put some oak, or I put some oak down here because this ground, these, all these ashes are just soaking wet. So you need to have a, a fire base down here for 
basically if you don't, you can still make things work, but it's gonna it's gonna really complicate the process because that, that moisture is just gonna sap the heat and sap the sap the fire right out of your out of your fire. Lid. I generally don't get too scientific, to be honest with you. Most of the time when I do a ferro rod fire, I start the tinder bundle on fire, and then I just start laying these smalls on top of it. There are some people that, that build the, the TP or build that, that first. I'll do that if I'm doing a lighter fire. In other words, I would if I was doing this for a lighter, I'd get all this teased up, and then I would start laying these all crisscross. You know, you got two smalls right there. Just kind of laying it up like this. And maybe I'll try to do this. Anyway. All these really tiny ones like this. And eventually you're going to get a nice teepee up here. And you can light it down here. And just kind of pull your fire lay over the top. And you're going to have a, a nice fire there. That's the technique I use with a lighter. With a ferro rod, actually maybe we can do it that way anyway. With a ferro rod, I like to get my tinder bundle on, on fire first because that way what happens is you get that big mass of, of material, combustible material here, all your smalls, everything, and you can't get your foot in there, I found anyway, you can't get your foot in there right, you can't get a good strike on it because all your material's in your way. So I want, I want to be able to concentrate purely on my tinder bundle and then put my, my material on top. I think we can still do that this time. So that's my plan. I'm gonna get this on fire, I'm gonna move it to the fire pit, and then I'm gonna put my smalls on top. Let's go over real quick a couple of uh, techniques with a ferro rod. And actually let's discuss ferro rods here real quick. There are basically two types of ferro rods that I've run across. There is a soft type, and there's a hard type. I'm not going to get into the technical specifications, but basically the soft type has more magnesium. The harder type, in my experience, puts off a hotter, hotter spark. The softer type, the sparks last long. So, there you go. I've got a 3 8 here, and I've got two half inches. These two half inches, one of them's the harder kind, and one of them's the softer kind. This big one, is the softer kind. This is actually the Pathfinder, the one that they sell on the Self-Reliance Outfitter store. This one is just a random one that I, I get from eBay. My two methods for striking these are what Justin likes to call the pull and pray, which I thought was pretty apt. But anyway, you, you lodge your hand up against something solid, and then you take your ferro rod, and actually it takes quite a bit of pressure to get the spark off, but you pull up and back very quickly, and that's gonna shower your sparks, hopefully, in your tinder bundle. And it actually helps if your spine of your knife is better than this one. That's the softer one. Now, the back of your knife method is fine. That's great. But you can see mine, I've been practicing with mine quite a bit. And you'll actually wear that spine down. So, what I like to use, it's a lot better, let's see this ferro path like one. Do you use the, you don't use the jimping, do you? No. I was going to grab my Mora Bushcraft Black. If you've got a Mora Bushcraft Black, that spine is absolutely amazing. I got a Genesis. You want that? Yeah, the Genesis is, is amazing too. But 
See how much better that was? Yeah. And it doesn't help doesn't help that my my wrist is a little weak anyway. Here you go. Here. Can you give me a more black? Oh wow. Look at your <laughs> <wrist>. <laughs> Perfect. Wow. That's a nice little pink sheath. I feel right at home with this pink sheath. This thing's awesome. Yes, that's a Wolf Customs, my <laughs> darling wife. <laughs> that's showering some sparks there. Yeah, you can really tell the difference. That that bush black, it's pretty impressive with that the spine, you know, that it's got. Yeah, that's a lot better. But you're going to have to do some spine maintenance. If you if you continually practice over and over and over again with your with the spine of your knife, you are going to have to do some spine maintenance and sharpen it just like you do your blades. The other method that works or that I use is the plant method, basically. And if you're going to use the back of your knife, you I could have my tinder bundle basically right on top here and then push down on that. And you can direct the sparks so much better. And you know, if, I don't know if any if any of you guys have followed my deal or whatever, but I've had a surgery in my my right hand, and my wrist is just even from doing that pulling back is starting to ache. So I mean, it's you need quite a bit of pressure on your on your ferrule rod. And now I can do the pressure on my left hand, and plus direct those sparks right where I want them. This is the softer ferro rod. I personally like that method a lot better. Let's say I wanted to do my little catch this on fire, and this is a tiny amount. I would want more than this. But let's say I wanted to do a transfer. Now, instead of Trying to aim my sparks, which it'll probably, you know, it may or may not work with this big rod, which, which I just did. But instead of having to hopefully have some sparks land on that, I know where they're going. They're going immediately right there. I can pick this up, you know, if it was bigger, and, and put it right in my tinder bundle. <clears throat> Who makes this sheath for you, Heather? Oh, she's not there. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's that? I said, who makes that sheath for you? Uh, Justin Wolf with Wolf Customs. Oh, okay. I was yeah. just curious. <laughs> so like oh, I was saying the, with the... The shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> like I was saying with the... With the if you're going to use the back of your knife, you're going to have to use some... You're going to have to do some, some knife maintenance, some spine maintenance. This is something, just a nice little striker that if I'm just practicing with or something, I don't have to worry about, if I'm lighting fire after fire after fire after fire, I don't have to worry about uh, lighting or you know, filing down my spine, resharpening it. It's just a little striker. I like this from my area. This push and plant method or whatever works really good for me for birch bark. So that's why I really like it. All right, let's go into the firelight again. We've got our tinder bundle. This is our mess that we're going to use. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to pretend this is going to be a lighter. I'm going to do a transfer method. So what I'm going to do is go ahead, do my lay right here, start my fire here, and transfer it over here. I've got these little tiny pieces of, like I was saying, these are small pencil lead size twigs. And I'm just going to totally randomly place them 
mostly with this method on the back side and leave this opening for me to put my my match or my on fire tinder book. But all this stuff was collected just <clears throat> just a few hours ago actually, right after it stopped raining. One thing I see a lot of guys do is take a look at how long this small is. I've, I see a lot of guys, they, they concentrate on how thin this particular material is right here, which is pencil lead size. That's what everybody you know says. If you can get smaller than pencil lead size, you want the smallest you can possibly get. But I see guys concentrate too much on how small this is, and so they're going to break this fork apart and maybe use this pencil slightly smaller than pencil later on in the process. I don't do that because what I want, this is just my base now. This may not catch on fire right now. It's going to add to the fire later on. But I'll put that down there. And now this small is at least a third to maybe even a half the distance of that stick past the tinder bundle. So that's going to, it, it just ensures your fire the flames will, the heat rises above the flame, and that heat will actually catch this stuff on fire better than if you just lay everything super tight down on top of your tinder bundle. It, it just gives it a lot more air, it get, the heat disperses better across the smalls. So, like I said, I see a lot of guys just snapping these little bitty things and then laying them down like that. I, I find it's much better to get those up above the tinder bundle. You know, if it's small, I'll go ahead and put it on there. If it's, it, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. Something like this, you know, maybe snap that right there. And all these little branches and stuff, all these little tiny smalls are above my tinder bundle. Look at I can't remember what the saying is right now, but basically the gist of it is fire likes chaos. So, you know, you don't want them all perfectly. That's another thing I see people do, is they'll take these smalls, and once they get their tinder bundle going, they, they line them all up perfectly right across the top of their tinder bundle, just like that. And basically what you're doing, once you get a lot of them on there, is you're starving the middle of your fire from oxygen. This, the flame licks up through the base of this, of these sticks, of this fire leg, and you know, if it's all closed down, there's no way, there's nowhere for that flame to go. That flame can't get up through and breathe. I mean, for me, man, fire is like a, like a living, breathing thing. I mean, you have to know what it wants in order to be successful at it. So it wants space, it wants fuel, you know, it's, it wants chaos, it wants a place to grow to. You can put a lot of sticks and a lot of material on this fire lay, so long as the very top, the very chimney of the teepee is open. Like if you ever see a teepee, that some Native American set up or whatever, there's always a smoke hole on the top. As long as you've got a smoke hole or several smoke holes or whatever, you can keep adding these sticks to it. Now, with how fragile this is right now, do I want to stick my foot in there and do that whole pull and plant method after I'm trying to get it all, all nice like this? That's, that, that's why I don't do it. You might, you could probably do the plant method. For sure, you could do the plant method. But still, your, you know, my wrist or my hand is going to hit some of these smaller ones. Now that I'm past the really tiny 
stage. You know, if I accidentally throw one of these pencil size ones in or whatever, and if I have a couple of those I want to throw on, that's okay. Sometimes I'll even take, if I, if I look back in my pile and I'm like, oh, I got some of these really tiny ones. I like putting some, some thicker ones in there and then doing the smaller ones even across the top of that. What that'll do is that'll give you several layers of fire. The base is, is obviously where your, the most of your fuel is and the most of your heat is. But if you get fire up into here, and this, this thing is going to collapse on itself. So you got a lot of heat down here, plus you got a lot of heat up here because I got a little tiny small up here maybe on fire. And it's, it's just all kind of interconnected and working together. I don't know, I got a lot of time on my hands. I think a lot about fire. <laughs> and if it's bone dry, and if you're in Arizona or someplace and it's 110 out, maybe you don't need to take all this time. But if you're someplace in a very wet environment, or it just rained all day or something, and you, know, you want a fire, you need a fire, better take your time and do your fire like correctly. I've seen some guys too, what they'll do is, like I said, I've got three sides of this fire kind of over the top of my tinder bundle. What some guys will do is they'll put like a stick right under here to kind of keep it, you know, like one of these sticks, one of these big pieces of oak or maybe half this size, whatever to push it under there. What I'll do sometimes is I'll just take a fork stick and I'll just kind of prop it up a tiny bit. That way it's not blocking the whole front of my fire lay. Just a little, you know, just a little something there. Now it's kind of elevated up so that when I transfer right here, you got a nice open spot. Ideally, I would have had my tinder bundle and then I would have uh, weed tops on top of that. I didn't see any weed tops here, but uh, you know, you don't have to go right away to these smalls. You can go weed tops, which are a great next tinder, and then your smalls. There can be real subtle differences on what the next step is. Find this knife that I haven't had. That cedar bark still has some moisture in it. I'm going to try to block the wind with my body. I wish somebody would have set some tarps up for this class, but it's all right. <laughs> there is a tarp. <laughs> Just not enough of them. Wow. I would have thought this would have went up a lot better than this.
fine line between blowing on it too much and not letting it catch and then letting it go out because there's not enough oxygen. The wind's doing pretty good right now. <laughs> Every once in a while it's good to blow on it, give it a little burst of heat. But I think that's going to take off right there. I've been carrying that cedar bark in my pocket for probably it's been about three hours now and it's still it was pretty marginal. I think a lot of times you'll see in these classes like this, most of the time people will bring tinder with them that's been bone dry. Yeah. Whereas this class, that material was gathered here on the spot and it rained for what four hours this morning yeah so I, I did that on purpose I actually had some you know I mean I even brought some birch bark I've got some fat wood I've got you know we've actually we've been gathering cedar bark the whole time we've been here and we've been protecting it from the rain for our normal fires I could have grabbed some of that you know I wanted to show you know it's been raining you can still make a fire it's not going to be the easiest but you can still make a fire now that this is down there like this, in other words, the lay has collapsed, I still have some smaller ones left over. That's what I'm talking about. This, your basic heat is down here, but you want some of this stuff catching on fire too. Because in case that base down there fails, this stuff on top is going to be your backup and help you out. Just like, you know, I know everybody says that the common theme is that the fire will go up, but you know, they make an upside down fire too. That's, that's not the most efficient thing, but it's still going to help. It's going to help those bigger sticks on the bottom catch because those, those holes are going to fall back and down into the center of that fire. Every time I try that, I get upset that it's not going where I want it to. There. Alright guys, like I said, I know this is pretty basic for most of you. And questions or anything? I think the thing that everybody needs to remember is what he showed you is a fire leg. It's not the fire leg. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is there are literally hundreds of different ways that you can achieve exactly what he did here today. But you'll notice that he took his time and by taking his time, he upped his chances of being successful. Whereas a lot of people will rush through this process, and I have been guilty of that. Every single person has been guilty of doing that, where they rush. And when we rush, we fail. But when we fail, we learn, and we learn to take our time. But like I said, there's multiple ways of doing a fire leg. This was just a method that he showed you here today. So you can take what you learned and apply it to different methods and get some different results. Well, just like the bird's nest, there's multiple ways to do bird's nest. I mean, I could have made a round bird's nest deal. I chose to make just a big softball size of it. I mean, that's, I, I think there's different bird's nests for different applications. And 
yeah, this is just this is just the way I like to do it. Well, Larry, I greatly appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. You bet. Give Larry applause here. <laughs>